You're listening to NT Paranormal After Dark. Nothing normal about it. Hey everybody, how's it going? So, um, we're back. I don't know why y'all keep watching, but you do. And so I brought people with me. Uh, Sarah's here again this time. Uh, from the very beginning, not getting sick in the next room, so that's good. And we also gave her red hair because that seems somehow paranormal real related to me. And um, Allie's back. So I'm actually really happy because this is the first podcast we have done in a year where pretty much the core group is together doing um, an episode on the podcast. So thanks for coming back, guys. This is awesome. Now, if only we could get, like, some cases to do together, that would be uh, yeah. <laughs> so, a lot of you guys are, uh, if y'all haven't seen me posting about it all week, y'all might be wondering, you know, why did everybody actually come into the studio for a podcast? Because we're actually interviewing somebody for a change. We're going to have a guest on the show, which we also haven't done in about a year. And I think we have a really good guest this time. Um, we've seen a lot of interest in the topic. Um... And I have a lot of interest in hypnotism myself. And, you know, when we went to the con um, last year, uh, was it the time? It was the first time we went to the con. It, it was the one in Tyler, right? It was the year before last year. Right. And, and we went and we saw a hypnotist there. And, and she was pretty cool to talk to her or whatever. But we, we kind of left with, with our doubts about it. And, uh, and and then when I started joining some online groups, like I've run into some new people to talk to. And one of the people I talked to, um, we invited on as a guest. And he said he would... Uh, be happy to talk with us about it. Um, and so I guess I will introduce him now. Uh, his name is Patrick T. Chrissy. Uh, and he's here to talk with us about all things related uh, to hypnosis. Uh, according to his bio, he's, this is his 23rd year since he first became a certified and licensed, certified and licensed to practice hypnosis. And uh, he's here basically to clear up any myths, any questions uh, we might have about it. Uh, Patrick made his career in retail management and business consulting. Uh, and at one time had his own radio show uh, called Minding Your Own Business. Uh, he's a public speaker. He's an author of a sci-fi action thriller, uh, Interference. Um, but now he's, he's mostly heavily involved into coaching, directing people that are seeking advice, uh, in the area of his specialties, which would be hypnosis, past life regression, and spirit release, all things that are just damn related to our show. So let's all welcome him to the show. Hey, Patrick, how's it going? Good. How are you guys doing today? You're doing great, man. Great. Running about an hour behind for technical reasons, <laughs> but, you know, whatever. It happens. But, hey, thank you so much for having me on the show, and I, I really want to salute you because these are the things – that I think people would really want to get more involved in and listen to. And I can't give you enough praise for doing this sort of thing. We need to do more of them. So thank you. Oh, yeah. I mean, our, our main goal, I feel, is just to get more information out there in like it in a non-biased way. Because, I mean, I feel like other people are doing this sort of thing. But, I mean, they already have kind of like a preconceived notion to it. And I, th I think one of the big things that we try to bring to it is to just come at it objectively and just get the information out there and, you know, and just discuss it in a pleasant manner. And let people make come up with their with their own ideas about it, you know, because we're all kind of in the same. We field. bring total ignorance to the table. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. You know what's really strange is that the conversation lately of different things has really increased, like just uh, reincarnation. I, I can't believe how much uh, it's like hypnosis and re uh, uh, reincarnation are back in, and Bigfoot is out. So. Well, I don't know. I, you know, I, I did the podcast two weeks ago on Bigfoot, and man, that that was probably one of the most tuned into live broadcasts yeah. uh, that I did. Everybody was super interested in Bigfoot, but um, it occurred to me like right after that that we're, we're starting to get a bigger following in the UK, and yeah. for whatever reason, it didn't occur to me that Bigfoot is mainly like a United States thing. Like, yeah, not, yeah I, I I thought. The UK had Bigfoot, and they're, no, they're, no, they're like, no. "What is Bigfoot?" And so, you know, I, I I'll tell you what, though, I'm concerned. Though, there's no new pictures of Bigfoot lately. I don't know why. Uh, <laughs> He's camera shy. Maybe. I'm telling you, it's cool. <laughs> Very cool, though. Great subject. Okay, so you've been um, practicing hypnosis for 23 years, or you've been licensed for 23 years. You've probably been practicing longer than that, like when you were uh, coming up, going to school, getting certified. So, I guess my first question is. Uh, 
what kind of training do you have to do to become a hypnotherapist? Like, what does being certified actually mean? What, what, what's, in, what's involved with that? Well, there's a lot of schools around the country, and there's some really good schools around the country. You know, and you have all kinds of, of ways of learning about hypnosis. But, you know, you'll always hear me talk about experience, being experienced and certified and, and getting taught the right way from the right kind of people. I mean, you have a lot of people who can, you can learn how to do hypnosis out of a book. I'm not going to kid you. But, you know, as you learn in the paranormal field, and I think one thing about the paranormal field is that we all need to be very responsible because when you're messing with people's lives, you're messing with people that are having some very serious problems and you're teetering on a lot of things. So I think respectfully we need to make sure that we're, we're doing everything we can do to not harm anyone ever in whatever practice we're doing in this field so right so you know, you it's, could, it's a matter it's a matter of ethics at a certain point sure. which is say which is something where we harp on a lot is you know ethics isn't just a medical field thing it's it, if you're presenting yourself as any kind of professional you, you have to be ethical yep and you got to look at you know there's a lot of schools around and i first started out way back when in orlando i went to a school that was run by a, a gentleman named ron devasto who ran the Hypnotic Research Society out of Orlando. And he's probably one of the kindest guys in the field because in the past 20-some years, the man has never raised his prices for uh, what he charges to get someone certified in school. So I, I really give kudos out to someone like that who's really trying to help the, the, the learning curve. And, and then there's other schools that you can go to, and I always encourage people to continue your education because some people, they just learn what they think is part of it. So this and, isn't something that you would like learn in, in, in like a typical, you, you have to go to like special school or something, or, is it, or do you actually go to like medical school or, or, or something like that for this? No, you don't have to go to medical school, even though some medical schools do advise people to, to get into this for, for what you can Oh, really? Hypnosis is so interesting because when you're in school, for, for example, you're sitting next door to, next to people that are from all walks of life, from all professions that are really interested in what they can do. And then you start, when you have your coffee breaks and stuff, you start asking, hey, who are you, where are you from, what do you do? And when you find out that there's three priests in the room with you, you start wondering and asking questions. But you learn about all these people who come from, maybe they do acupuncture, maybe they're into uh, paranormal research, or maybe they're, they're doing massage. You would be amazed at the interest level. But a lot of people, like anything in life, they're looking for answers, and they're trying to reach out and see what they can do to help others. So it's a great thing. I did a, the chronic pain study I did at UT. Um, they were helping people deal with chronic pain and with non-opiate pain management in conjunction with using opiate pain managers. But they had people there who were doing hypnotism. Doctors there that had been certified in hypnotism that were helping people. So, so actually, like, there. you know, medical doctors mm -hmm. actually use hypnotism. Yeah, they, they were medical it, doctors. So it's, it's, at, it's not just like a... Uh, like a, a alternative medicine thing, but it's actually recognized by like the medical field. Well, and they were working in biofeedback and stuff like that too. So hypnotism, biofeedback, and certain what people call alternative medicine were put in place there to try and help people. They were also using the normal idea of what is medicine along with these other ideas. Oh, th that's really cool. Actually, have you, oh. had, have you had any experience working with like actual medical field sort of thing, like in, in that aspect? Like, do they call you in for, for things like she's talking about, like pain management or stuff like that? Or do you just do it in like a... Well, uh, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Let's look at this. Let's look at this from a couple of different points of view. Is that, and, and she brings up a great point, because if you have to understand that, look at medical studies. They're done with placebos. You know, that is simply the power of suggestion and the power of the mind. And it's amazing what the human mind is capable of and can do. The mind, again, you have the basic standard sayings, the mind controls the body. It's very true. Mm -hmm. You have a mother taking care, single mom taking care of three kids. The three kids get sick. The mom tells herself, I can't get sick. I will not get sick. It's the power of the human mind is absolutely amazing. Yeah, I, I mean, one of, the, one of the big things I advocate just for, like, not necessarily like hypnosis or whatever, but the power suggestion is pretty powerful. I, like, uh, we, we kind of feel, I don't, I don't want to say there's a lot of evidence to back it up, but with like a lot of the cases we take on, we feel like people actually like create their own hauntings and, and paranormal happenings because they believe it so deeply themselves. And, and there, there's not like a, a physical component there. It, it's kind of not like they're crazy or anything, but you know, it, it is kind of controlled in their head and it, 
it they kind of externalize it in that way because because the, yeah, they're so drunk and it becomes very real to them. Uh, like Kate and, case in point, um, Tyler, we were doing the movie theater thing, and after a while, it started to run around, like run away from us. The movie theater um, investigation. I don't remember the, the investigation, yeah. but what, what are you talking about? Like, like, they're towards the end when everybody started seeing things, and this was happening over here. No, this oh, was happening yeah, over yeah, here. Yeah, yeah. It, it took on a lot. Yeah, it took on a whole another life. Which is one of the reasons, like, why when we're, we're when we're on a legitimate investigation, only half of us know what the stories are, and then the other half of us go in blank, because everybody we told, like, the stories about that location, suddenly we're seeing all the things that we told them people see there. But any anybody that came in and didn't want to know anything about it, they they would pick up on some things, but it wasn't all the same things that everybody else said. They they kind of went on and did their own thing. Um, so uh, so I'm curious what what got you interested to the point you were like I I, I need to study this, research it, be, become a hypnotist. And um and well, and like we talked about yesterday, what's the difference between like a, a hypnotist and a hypnotherapist, or, or or the reason you would go by one or the other? Yeah, well, when I was a kid, you're gonna you're gonna love this, but I was amazed by two things as a real young kid was was pickpockets and hypnotists. Okay, so I watched <laughs> I watched these things on TV, and to me, they were just amazing. And I go, how do they do that? And, you know, and of course, you always watch the Dracula movie where Dracula hypnotizes somebody to hold still while he's going to kill him. And stuff like that fascinated me. So I figured one of those professions was going to get me in jail. So I figured <laughs> as I grew older, uh, I was uh, living in Orlando many years ago. And my wife at the time, uh, one night we're looking for something to do. And she was going through the local paper and she saw this uh, uh, one night class on past life regression. And she, I, she said, let's go to this. And I thought, oh, I don't want to go to that. And she's like, you've talked your whole life about your interest in this stuff. And she goes, and you don't want to go? Come on, we're going. So <laughs> I went, and it was so great because I love these, these kind of things because you go in, you pay your money, they close the door, and the guy says to you, the first thing he says is, no matter what's said in here, it stays in here, and everybody has a story. That's all he had to say. And everybody does have a story. It's so interesting. So... I, he at the end of his seminar he did a, a group a past life regression and uh, which is different for everybody I experienced things in flashes and I kept these pictures just kept coming into my head and I couldn't get over it and when he was saying to look down and, and look at yourself I couldn't get by my very large female breasts I, as I looked down. <laughs> yeah that would, that would be and, that'd be a little jarring I would think you know, it was really a shocker, and, and it was just, to me, it was so amazing, and I came out of it, and I was so interested, and I signed up right there, and I started my first uh, class, and I, I went on and uh, took more classes, and then I went across the country to Minnesota to one of the bigger ones where I spent two weeks uh, and paid an awful lot of money. The, the good ones are worth it, where you pay an awful lot of money, but you get the best kind of one-on-one -on -one training that's available out there today. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I think, I think if you're going to learn anything, a one-on-one -on -one environment is always the best, but you can't always do that with everything, you know, because there's so many people that want to get into different fields and aspects of things. So, um... Yeah, and it can't be an experience, though, either. I mean, people, like I had told you yesterday, is that people sign up for these things, and what I did was I committed to myself that I was going to have 100 free clients to get a base, and if you don't have a base for anything, how can you how can you do anything safely, carefully, or anything? So right. I truly am very, very big on people who have lots of training, lots of clients in their in their in their uh, repertoire, and they're experienced in what they do because hypnosis is about kind of like what you guys do. It's very interesting for people that are like researchers or detectives because it's not what people think it is. Everyone have a very uh, a different approach of what actual hypnosis is because actual hypnosis. I, I wouldn't is, compare us because I, I have absolutely no credibility yeah. at all. So <laughs> I, I, I don't yeah. think you want to lump yourself in with us. No. Well, it's, no, I'm but I mean, the more tips. curious you are, the better off you are because when you're doing, let's say, past life regression, for instance, to me it's like being in the most interesting movie you've ever been in in your life. And you're just sitting there waiting and you get to ask these great questions, which are simple, like, tell me what happens next. Or, go to a very significant event that happened in that lifetime. Real simple stuff, but the answers that you're waiting for are just really cool. Um, 
so so like we we were kind of talking yesterday during the the pre-interview or whatever um uh you were very very specific that uh I, I should refer to you as a hypnotist, not a hypnotherapist, which th that was my total yeah. mistake. But but the things you were telling me about it, I thought were really important that we should bring up in today's internet. Like everybody should kind of hear it. Um, so yeah. You, like what? And, and of course, they weren't with us yesterday. So why why do you call yourself a hypnotist, not a hypnotherapist? Because because I, I feel like a lot of what you do is therapy, um, and, and that's the that's the main goal of it. So why is it kind of a no no to call you a hypnotherapist. Well, when you start doing these things and you educate yourself and you say to yourself, there's people that are out there and they're not experienced in what they do and they give, everybody has some profession that gives another person a bad name. You are always at odds with people that are in the medical field. For example, a psychiatrist. A psychiatrist, you can go to a psychiatrist and pay them $100 a day for a year and a half to try and find out something that happened to you in your childhood that has dealt with a condition that you're having today. Or you could pay one time, come to a hypnotist like me, and I will find out in one session what that is, what that event was, what triggered it, what is now triggering it for you in the present day, and how we can rectify that situation. So the good part about hypnosis is that you want to, you definitely want to work side by side with doctors and psychiatrists. In the state of Florida where I am, you can't get a license without having a medical doctor put his reputation and his signature on the line for you. You have to have a letter of recommendation from a medical doctor saying he will be on call for you 24 hours a day. And, and I, I, th I thought that was letter. the most interesting thing that you told me because I, I never, I never thought about that angle of it, and I, I didn't realize that. I, I don't know if that's true. I don't know if that's just for Florida where you're at, or if that's nationwide, or you know, if everybody's got different regulations or whatever. But, I mean, that kind of sets my mind more at ease about it, knowing that, you know, a medical doctor actually has to sign off basically on your training before you can even start practicing or, or calling yourself a hypnotist or hypnotherapist or anything like that. And that adds a level of legitim legitimacy to it that um, when I was just doing some mild research, like, online, like, that never came up anywhere. And if that had actually come up somewhere... Um, I, I might have had different ideas going into it before actually talking to you about it. Um, yeah. It's just, it, that, that was just something I found really interesting because I, I didn't know that. And Sarah, uh, you were an EMT for a long time. And, and uh, I, did you know that? No, it, no it, idea. Like the, but doesn't that change your mind about it being somebody that's like so involved in with like medicine and, and things like that? Because I mean, all three of us were pretty skeptical of, you know, everything at first in my, my initial thoughts and research on hypnotism was kind of like, well, you know, it, it's kind of maybe has some merit, but you know, it's, it, there's the potential for being fake, but I didn't know that medical doctors actually signed off. Considering on this my report. experience with medical doctors, I might actually trust a hypnotist. More yeah. Than trust a um, true. Well, <laughs> I don't know. Like, it's just, it blows my mind because I kind of, I always figured it was like something for, People, like, who are a little bit more susceptible to this, like, you know, like, I figured, like, if you didn't, I'm trying to think of a way to, that not insulting, forgive me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> That's our so, shtick, we're just insulting because we have absolutely uh, no people I figured, skills. I guess I always thought it was for people who were more open to suggestion and were gullible who went and saw the hypno like hypnotists like i've never really put stock in it i guess so um yeah but so it, i found this but, but that pro that probably comes from us not understanding it too like well, yeah like, like we, we've never given it a full chance and that kind of brings us to the the next question yeah that's this. uh which is why i'm so excited to talk to you <laughs> Yeah. So, so how does the hypnotism work, and what are what what are the benefits to this, like psychologically and medically? What, um, how could someone benefit from this? Well, let's let's talk about what is hypnosis, because when you get you want to get simple, because people complicate things, you know. And life is about make it easy. Hypnosis is nothing more than focused attention. People, you have been hypnotized millions of times in your life. You ever been driving a car where you're listening to the radio and you're thinking about something else and you're driving down the highway 
And all of a sudden, your mind kind of jumps back, and you say to yourself, oh, my God, where was I? You were daydreaming. You were gone. Yeah, you yeah I, there I get for... all the way from work to home and, and not realize, like, <laughs> yeah. how I got there, that that highway hypnosis thing where you have to, like, yeah. there's so many Think accidents on the road because people yeah. aren't you know, paying attention because they're, they're kind of zoned out. And I, I didn't think about that until you'd actually. So think yeah, about it. Now you're driving a 2000 pound bomb, right? You're driving a bomb, but you know what? At no time were you in danger or was anybody else, believe it or not, because your subconscious mind knows how to drive that car. Yeah. Even though your conscious mind took a little trip, your subconscious mind knows when to hit the gas, when to hit the brake, when to hit the turn, say no, still looking around. So you're not, you're just not there for that moment. Your attention or your focused attention is somewhere else. The difference between the subconscious mind and the conscious mind is absolutely amazing. The subconscious mind is the is the brain and the real computer. That's the real you. That's who you are. There are no filters. There are no worries in the subconscious mind. It's it's the real you, and that's what's amazing about it. Now, let's talk about the second part of that question was benefits and things of that nature. If you understand the premise that the mind controls the body, which it does, and you understand the premise that it's just focused attention. The truth of the matter is anyone who wants to can be hypnotized because, here's the big saying, all hypnosis is self-hypnosis. You're doing it to you. I'm not doing it to you. If I asked you to take that microphone in front of her lovely face and move it three inches to the left because it's blocking her beautiful face, <laughs> could you do that for me, please? Oh, I guess that's for your view. I didn't even think about it. <laughs> yeah, it's blocking her beautiful face. Okay, you did that, right? I didn't order you. I didn't make you. I didn't. You could have said right, no. I, I you submitted right to it. You, you made a suggestion, and I followed. I made a suggestion. Whether you choose to do it or not, that's up to you. So it's really important that you understand all hypnosis is self hypnosis. I'm just guiding you. If you don't want to go, you're not going to go. Now you may not go for different reasons. People don't understand because people may say, "Oh, I went to a hypnosis show and I was ready to get hypnotized, but nothing happened. It doesn't work. It's it's all crap." You know what? A lot of times it's about fear and trust. You have to trust the person that is going to do this to you because in our little minds, we are afraid that we are going to say something that everyone's going to find out or that we will lose control. It's a lot about trust too. So there's a lot of issues that that come to success, but hey, only a person who is mentally retarded and cannot focus their attention is the only real person who can't be hypnotized. Other than that, anybody who wants to can be hypnotized. And it's about trust. It's about building up that trust. Never really thought about that. <laughs> well, I'm trying to think how to word that. I mean, I would, so, yeah, I, I agree on that sense. It, but in, I would think there are people that are going to have a harder time you know, maybe everybody can be hypnotized, but maybe they would have a harder time going into it. Like somebody with AD and D, AD and D, not ADHD. Yeah, ADHD, <laughs> where they have problems focusing their attention. Maybe, and and I and I guess that's kind of what you're saying is somebody that can't focus their attention because of outside of their own means. But that makes me wonder, though. Like, like Caitlin has ADHD, and so she would probably have a hard time undergoing hypnosis. But if she's on her meds that actually help her focus, then you could you could have like medication assisted hypnosis. In, in but I wonder I wonder if any kind of med, does medication or anything like that interfere with that process at all? If, you know what it's and again medication as we're learning guys and we all know this right it affects different people in different ways and some of it really really negative. Look at the suicide rates for some of these medications, man. Oh, yeah. It's very scary. And I'm so glad you're bringing that up because that you really got, like I tell people, when you're first doing it, just like you do with paranormal research, when you go into somewhere, and I do the same thing if I'm doing spirit release, I got to go in somewhere, I spend an hour solid asking you questions. There's so much about you I have to know to do my end properly. So that's why, again, I see people on, online and social media who give advice out, they don't even know what they're dealing with. That's not responsible at all. And I really wish that we'd all get a little bit more responsible and do the right thing. I love the saying, do no harm. Just do no harm, you know? Oh, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Uh, what's, what do we got on the next? <laughs> all that show the, prep for nothing. Alternative medicine was the next. <laughs> <laughs> well, we kind of covered that. Yeah.
Uh, well, in, let, me, let me bring up something about that, just so you, you know, because it's really cool. When you think about how you can control and you can teach people pain management, you can teach things like that. One of the easy techniques that works really, really well is when you hypnotize someone, and most people can relate to going to a dentist and being shot up with Novocaine. And the easiest thing you can do is to uh, recreate the feeling, not the pain or the anxious uh, activity that you get around taking a shot, but the feeling of your jaw when it is full of Novocaine. And you can teach them, again, the mind controls the body, to transfer that feeling from the jaw to the area of the body that is in pain. And you can give them absolute pain-free for as long as they want it to happen. It's real. It's fascinating. But when you teach someone how to do that and they experience that one time, and you see someone who's been in chronic pain for years, just experience 10 minutes of no pain, and you see the tears start coming down their eyes, I mean, you know you've done something good for someone. And, and you know, if you teach them properly, they can help themselves in the, in the future. That'd be something that Sarah would really you know, be interested. Um, I know you don't know a whole lot about us because you're, you're kind of new to our circle, but um, both the ladies here, they both suffer with chronic pain. Um, Sarah has uh, CRPS, which is one of the most uh, painful conditions on the, the pain scale to have, and it's, it's all neurological. And when I first said that, you know, I was bringing a hypnotist on the show, like her first question was, could, is this somebody that could teach me how to do self-hypnosis or, or hypnotize me to make me not feel pain. And I felt like that was a good question. Well, too, because CRPS, it mimics phantom limb syndrome. So my hand was crushed a few years back. My brain never forgot that feeling. So now my brain is always sending pain signals. It always sends the signal that it has just now been hurt. When Even when it hit, healed, my brain never stopped sending those signals. So it's interesting, especially with this, because it is my brain controlling it. It's really nothing to do with an injury to my hand. It's all to do with my brain sending the wrong signal. Yeah, and I'm so happy you're here, and I'm so glad you're bringing that up just that way, because that is, that's typical for a lot of people. And again, let's not forget, like she just said, she, and she's smart enough to recognize the tie-in there, that people, you know, what we think and what we fear and what we don't want to have happen again. There's nothing that we don't want to have happen more again than pain. Nobody wants pain. Yeah, it's nature's and, deterrent. You know? yeah. <laughs> it's, oh, yeah. it's, it's, uh, I mean, really, really and that's how we learn. Like it is, children, like newborns learn as children when something hurts. You don't know, do it's, it again. Yeah. yeah, it's a signal that goes straight to their brain that says, "Oh, don't do that." You know, that's hot or whatever. Yeah. But it's, and again, it's what's really cool. What's really cool is separating what happens to you in this lifetime, where, where again, when you tie this into past life regression where people have had deaths, injuries, traumatic stuff happen to them in past lifetimes and sometimes it's carried over into this lifetime. It's such an interesting subject to talk about and and the benefits that can help from this are just absolutely amazing and I wish you know as we get to be the opioid epidemic is proving that we're, we're using way too many meds and stuff like that and I think you're going to see a huge rise again just like the paranormal research you're going to see a huge rise in uh, holistic healing again. I, I think it's really going to become very popular again. Um, so we're, we're kind of talking about like the, me the mechanics of how hypnosis works, you know, where it's, it's self-hypnosis and re really it's just focused concentration. But, um, and so everybody could self-hypnotize, but obviously there's a, not a market, but that there's a need for a hypnotist there to guide people through that process. And I think that's really the important part. Um, but what gets you from the point of not knowing how to do that with somebody to knowing how to do that? Like, um, what, what do you learn as far as like techniques? Like, do you have a specific technique that you use that's different from other hypnotists or is, is there like a certain mechanic that's the same between all of you guys that, that are legitimate anyway? Well, the, the whole thing, again, if you, if, you, if you can determine that a person trusts you enough to allow you to do this, and if you can, if, one of my first questions is always to you is, what is your expectation? What do you think hypnosis is, and how do you think a hypnotist can hypnotize you? It's going gonna, it's gonna to give you an automatic clue. You have a lot of people that will say, and it's from the movies, unfortunately, you're going to hold a watch up, and you're going you're gonna to put it from my face, and I'm going to fall into a deep sleep. And you know what I reach into my bag and pull out when you say that? 
I reach out and I pull out a watch because mm -hmm. that's so. The, so you're saying the pocket yeah. watch does work though. If they, believe, if they believe it works. Right, they have to believe it enough. A absolutely. See, that's great. And again, anything works. It's just if I'm talking to you and guiding you and you're accepting that suggestion, you will do it, no matter what it is. And again, you have your instant, you have an instant induction, which will work with people. And it just matters about your, your comfort with it. Now, before we get off that, I want to bring up one thing that you talked about, which is there's good and there's bad in every profession in the world. A good hypnotist, when you, back when I was charging, and I only charged people for about two years, I couldn't, I, I felt so bad, I wanted to keep helping people. I felt guilty charging them, I just did. I wanted to help people. But and, and that's, what, that's one of the things that really draws me to you, too, is because, like, we, we don't charge our clients either. No. But, but, but there, there's a lot of people that are in the same field as us. We found, we found out early on yeah. they charge in, um, without, like, bad mouth. And it's okay to make a living, um, but it, it's... It's real hard to trust somebody that's claiming to help you that has some kind of monet monetary co uh, compensation for it. Um, yeah. it you know, I, I've always had a hard time with maybe going to see um, a psychiatrist or whatever, because what is the motivation for them to actually help you or fix you? Because it, at that point, you would actually stop going and stop paying them. Yeah. And so yeah. it, I, I tend to trust people that don't take compensation more than I do yeah. people that you know want to charge by the hour or whatever for a paranormal yeah. investigation or, or, or hypnotism that's why I connect with you so well you know talking with you online because yeah. you, you really seem like you're out there um, doing it to do it to help other people and not yeah. just you know make money off of it yeah and let me answer your question and help you because I'll tell you and this is how you any of you can decide if you want to get hypnotized by someone in your area is that any good hypnotist a good one an experienced one I'm not in it for the money okay if I'm charging people and I do it one time my job is to show you how to do this yourself you'll never a good hypnotist one time is all you need to go they will teach you how to do self-hypnosis they will teach you how to get in that state yourself they will teach you how to help reprogram or self-program yourself for the desired things that you want to have happen in your life a good one will and that's why you'll always see me, whether I'm posting on uh, social media, telling people find an experienced trained hypnotist that's been around that you got great recommendations on. Because you know what, I'm not I'm not in it for the money. I, I don't like people that are in it for the money. You know, people should help people always. Catherine uh, Heath is uh, on the board right now, and she posted a good question. She said, is that similar to guided meditations? That's a question I had too, because I do like yeah. when, I, when I have insomnia. I'll yeah. load up like the YouTube videos, the self hypnosis guided meditation thing. Is that sort of the similar to what you do? Very much so. And a lot of times when people don't understand, that's why, and I'll tell you, you know, again, there's things out there. Like, you know, I heard someone on social media last week say, oh, just go on YouTube and uh, fall asleep while you play some hypnosis tape. I would never, ever, ever recommend that for anybody. You need to force yourself to listen to it while you're wide awake and make sure there's no little subtle things that are planted somewhere. Yeah, you, yeah. You, you could be playing something that tells you to wake up at 3.15 a.m. and murder your whole family and not know it because you're asleep when it happens. I just keep thinking yeah. about that episode of Friends when Chandler had oh, that yeah. to get him to quit smoking, but it, it made him want to act like a woman. Yeah, you are strong. Oh my God. That's funny. That's so funny. <laughs> yeah. I love that. I uh, love Catherine that. Catherine also, uh, she, she had a comment up here. She said, uh, reduces opioid dependency. I think that was a couple of questions back, but... Yeah. I mean, that's a good point. So you think you think a, a good hypnosis practice, if, if it was brought more into the mainstream, could actually help with that problem that you talked about with, like, over-prescribing and things like that? It, yeah, definitely. It can. And, and, again, you walk a very fine line when you start talking medical because doctors, they just – they don't want to lose money, and they get really – you know, there's one, some that are very open. I love guys that are very open. When I lived in Asheville, North Carolina – one of the things I started the Western New York Hypnotherapist uh, Association up there, and some doctors there were very open-minded and very interested and came to our lectures and gave lectures, and it was just wonderful. So if people wake up a little bit more, I think it will be very helpful. But there's really cool things you can do with hypnosis that, again, once you make someone understand what is happening, and, again, things are you know, psychologically related to a lot of stuff that happens that becomes physical. 
So it's a fine, fine balance. And again, you want an experienced person that's dealt with this many times before right. you tackle something. Well, yeah. In, 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 oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. With the new opiate rules, there might be a lot of people that are pushed into seeking alternative yeah. therapy. Right. Yeah. So because it'll they, be kind of a force. They thing. just changed the law. And so yeah. now they can only prescribe a certain amount of opiate. It doesn't matter what's wrong with you. From pancreatic cancer to a broken limb, now they can only prescribe a certain amount of uh, opiates. And my doctor had specifically said it's going to push people to alternative medicine. It's going to push people to the black market or it's going to push them to suicide. So hopefully it. Yeah, I would rather him see to go to alternative yeah, medicines he, first and at least he give it recommends, a shot. He, my pain doctor actually recommends alternative medicine, so he's one of the people that's more open with that. Well, and, and one of the things I liked about Patrick, like one of the reasons I felt comfortable bringing on is, is and I also want, he's not saying that hypnosis is an absolute replacement yeah, for, right. for good medic. People need medications, but it's a good supplement, and for some people, it could be a really good replacement. And a lot know, of people on opiates, they rely, and I've noticed that with some pain doctors I've been to, they rely just, they're not interested in seeking other surgical interventions. They're not interested in PT. They're yeah, not all they want to do yeah, is throw to meds. The meds. And, yeah. and that's why I had to switch pain doctors so many times is because I wanted a doctor who wasn't just going to throw meds. Someone who was going to go, okay, here's some alternative ways we could deal with this instead right. of taking 300 pills. Because, because you do the physical therapy, and the mm -hmm. physical therapy actually helps you more yeah. more than the actual drugs do. But you have to be able to manage your pain levels in to be, between. To do the physical therapy. To do the physical well, therapy. Well, and insurance doesn't pay. Yeah. Insurance that, will pay for pills. Right, right which, is, for which is another problem. Yeah. yeah. That's... Let me, uh, let me give you another example, guys, which is uh, something that people don't take into account. Look at stuttering. Now, stuttering is something that really affects a person's life. But, you know, under hypnosis, they don't stutter, not a drop. Oh, not it's, a it's drop. like a, a lot of people that stutter, uh, if they're uh, public speakers or singers or actors, when, when they're actually doing that task, it's almost like they're becoming another person. Like, um, they, focus, they focus. Well, so they, they've done studies with like an EEG, and it turns out when, when people are just having normal conversation, like they're not performing, you know, they're just being themselves, a certain part of their brain lights up, and, and they'll stutter, and, and they'll have certain social cues and things like that. But then when they turn it on, like, you know, you put them behind a microphone, mm -hmm. and, you know, they're a singer or whatever, they're using a different part of their brain to do the same functions. And it's, it's just crazy how different parts of your brain can kind of just take the wheel and make your body do different things. That, that's kind of one of the reasons where I'm more on, on the cusp of hi hypnotism is, is actually like a thing because, you know, may, maybe it's not like what you've seen on TV with the magicians and things like that. You know, there's so many things that are on TV that kind of wreck your perception yeah. of it. But, you know, all our studies that we've done on the idometer effect and things like that, we know your subconscious can totally take over your body. So it's not much of a leap to say, well, is there a way we can control that process or, or are there people that know how to guide you through that process? I, I mean, do you agree with, with that kind of thought process on it? Yeah. And it, again, there's things that people don't understand. And the big question you always get is... Uh, you know, are you going to make me do something I don't want to do? Are you going to make me chop, cluck like a chicken, walk like a duck, all those things? The, the answer to that is that every one of us is built in with a critical factor. We have these little safety things in our body that, you know, call it God, call it the universe, whatever you believe in, provided for us. And the mind is a, an amazing thing. But if you were to hypnotize two people side by side, yourself and Jeffrey Dahmer when he was alive, sitting down on the couch, and you made the same suggestion to both of you at the same time, and said, I want you to go in the kitchen, pick up a steak knife, and go out and stab the first person you see. Now, Jeffrey Dahmer, because in his mind, that's normal. That's yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. What yeah. Right. About that? He would go and do that. You, being told anything under hypnosis that you don't agree with, want to do, or is against your critical factor, you would simply either do nothing and sit there, or you would open your eyes and come out of it. Yeah, you, you, you have to have kind of like a, uh, a predetermination to, to do whatever that suggestion is, which, which would probably be what sends you to seek somebody that does hip, hypnosis in the first place. I almost called you a hypnotherapist. Seek <laughs> <laughs> hypnosis in the first place, like because you're, you're wanting help in your life or you're wanting a certain thing, so you're kind of letting go of that, I don't want to do that factor, and go look for it. And then, you know, that would be like the next step. And so if somebody, yeah. you know, told me to do something... 
that I absolutely at my core didn't want to do, I'm not going to do it. But if it's something that's like a, a secret desire or whatever, then I might go through with it because my brain says, well, you're under hypnosis. It's okay. Sort of, yeah. sort of deal. So, Yep. Uh, Julie says, do we subconsciously use information from past lives in this life? Actually, I think Allie was just about yeah, to start that asking goes, about Yeah, that goes, actually, that's a pretty yeah, good segue. Yeah, and I every, does everyone have past lives? Yeah, um, so in addition to, um, hypnotism, you do past life regression. Uh, can you explain what that is and how it, in if it differs from hypnotism? You know, what, what's great about reincarnation and past life regression is it's really, uh, again, it's on the rise again. People are really, really getting interested. So, I, I, again, I can't, you know, people want to be in absolutes, and I'd love to be in absolutes. Let me describe myself for you. I am the world's biggest skeptic in anything. I always have been, but I'm always open-minded and willing to try. That's the beauty of, I think, when you do paranormal studies or research or anything. I think you have to have an open mind, but I'm a skeptic first, you know? It's the same thing with when people want to uh, discuss reincarnation. I can't tell you if it's real or not real. I can only tell you from having performed over a thousand uh, regressions on people, I can tell you what the patterns are. I can tell you what the majority of the things are that are revealed to me. That's all I can tell. I'm not saying this is this definitively. I'm saying, hey, here's what a thousand people, here's what their experiences happened. So it's, it's telling you what their experiences are, but can I say it's for certain? No, and I would never try to do that. I mean, you know, allow people to, to form their own thoughts and form their own opinions. That's what I say. Exactly. Yeah, I've, like I've got my own theory on like, because I don't, I don't know, I don't want to say I don't believe in reincarnation, but I, the, I don't, you know, as a scientist, there's, there's no evidence that, you know, pe people's souls come back, you know, and re-inhabit or whatever. But I've, I have always really, really liked the idea of genetic memory, which is, is one of those really cool theories that are out there. And so, you know, in my, in my logical head, trying to put logic to something I don't understand, I thought, well, genetic memory is kind of a thing. Could it be that a lot of those memories are actually stored in our subconscious and our genes, and that's what you're actually accessing? Maybe not a life that I lived before, but maybe a life that is back in my genetic sequence like four or five generations before me, but that information is still stored in, in my body and my genes. And when you access your subconscious, that could be a thing that you're actually accessing. The one thing yeah. that swayed my idea on that was that one story I told you all about Caitlin. Yeah, that was the one. Oh, oh yeah. Tell that. that he would, he would so, love it. My daughter was, I had a friend, uh, she was going to be my bridesmaid, uh, but, and she was pregnant, and she uh, lost the baby in a car wreck. Um, All right. uh, about a month after she lost that baby, I turned up pregnant. So I always had this weird idea in my head, like, I stole her baby. I don't know where that came from, but uh, <laughs> my daughter wasn't very verbal until she was about three. They thought maybe she was on the autism spectrum, but very mildly. But one day when she was about two and a half, she was in the bathtub, and she just deadpan looked up at me, and she said, you know, and I never told her about my friend. She said, I was supposed to go to another mommy first, but she wasn't ready to have a baby. So I went back, and I went to you instead. And I had to, like, leave the room because I was like, that's because I didn't believe in uh, that wasn't my area of religion back then. But it just kind of threw me for a loop. But whenever I'm talking about this past life stuff, that's always the one story that has always affected my opinion on it. Was, I'm so glad you're here. I am I, so glad you're here because that is a typical, typical. What I can tell you is, again, I can tell you patterns and things that are reoccurring in many, many different situations. And you have brought up one of the things that I love discussing because children, kids, young kids, are, they, don't, they haven't been, you know, tainted yet mm -hmm. by parents and things and situations. So one thing I can tell you, because I don't tell a lot of people, hey, you can do this in school, but you listen to children, very young children. And I learned a long, long time ago, A, words are very important. Words are very powerful. But if you have a young child that's at that age, you're describing perfectly and I, I, I do this now. I do this every day. If I have a kid that will talk to me and I'm somewhere, I look at the kid and I simply say one thing. I say, hey, tell me about, do you remember way back when, when you were big? Can you tell me about what happened when you were big before? Do you remember? And you just be quiet and listen. 
and kids will say things that will blow your mind away. Oh, yeah, and my that's son when, said that before too, back when I was big. Yeah, yep. oh, that's back great. when I was big, this happened. And he was yep. old enough that I was like, okay, maybe something influenced him. But she was so little when she said that, that there was no way anything had. She was so yeah. little. It was but so it's weird. wonderful, isn't it? Do, do you find, do you find like, if you had to put a percent, like, um, you know, obviously not every person you talk to is going to have a past life. But do you find most people have a past life, or uh... I, I can tell you this: if I if I if I want to go there, and most clients, other than an atheist, they're going there. I I've never, other than an atheist, not found a person didn't have a past life and had the experience. Never. An atheist just that's where their mind is at. It's this lifetime, and I can regress them back to being a baby. I can regress them back to being in their mother's womb, but that's it. They won't allow themselves to go anywhere else. Up mm -hmm. to them. It's fascinating stuff. Fascinating. And I've tried. Let me tell you, I've tried with <laughs> atheists. I've tried. It's fun. It, to me, it's it's interesting. You so, know. So when you do the so when you do the past life regressions with people, like um, so I, I get the I get the benefit of like the hypnosis because like Catherine asked, you know, could could that help with appetite, make good addictions, things like that? Yeah, and, and we and we covered that. Yeah. But how does how does doing a past life regression with somebody uh, benefit that client in that way? What, what what is what is that what is that add that you feel is beneficial to their life? Well, it kind of ties into what you were talking about earlier, which is fascinating. When you talk about what happened in a past lifetime and what may have been carried over into this lifetime that affects me today, you look at things, and there's a lot of different ways you can look at things. As we were discussing yesterday for a little bit, you look at people who get sudden medical illnesses or sudden addictions where there seems to be no reason that a person suddenly became an alcoholic or a rageaholic or a sex addict or started just absolutely being abusive when they were the kindest nicest person ever is this something that has been lying dormant for years is this again the questions I ask myself is this a an attachment of some sort or is this something from their past lives that's now starting to show itself and is affecting them in the present day. That's where the detective comes in, in all of you. That's where you've got to be a good detective, and you got to be able to dig to find out those kind of answers. Yeah. Uh, uh, a question Allie brought up earlier is like, um, so so when you take somebody like into a past life, or you start digging into that, you know, usually, you know, from what we hear, or we've seen, people will have like one past life that they recount. But do do you find that it, it, have you have you ever done one where people will have like more than one past life, and or, or is there like a limit on it? Or I, I mean, it, it, you can, you can and again this I can only tell you what has happened from my experience with over a thousand. You know I can only give you my experience, but the my record was uh, I was with a young lady. We went through six lifetimes, and it took about three hours. Now at the end of three hours. I'm pretty much spent. So, you know, again, I can only do it so long to where I can keep my attention because a good hypnotist, you got to understand, again, you're a detective. I have to be able, your eyes are closed, you're sitting in front of me. I, you have to become an expert at reading body language. I have to know from your rapid eye movement when something's happening and something's not happening. I have to know when you're completely under hypnosis and when you're not. You find that out when people are faking by certain cues. There are certain things I can find out which is I can do something as simple as squeeze the back of your neck. When you are totally, totally relaxed, I can tell you every muscle back there, if I just squeeze the back of your neck or even your arm sometimes, I can lift up your wrist and drop it. Mm -hmm. If it doesn't but, drop like a rock, you're not you're not where I want you to be. Right. That, that break, you said something, uh, just to back up like, uh, real quick, like you said, um, you can tell when somebody's faking. Why, would, why do you think somebody would fake being under hypnosis? Like, what, what would be the reason behind that? Well, you know, you say you go to a bar and you go to one of those uh, hypnosis stage things. And again, I, I, I've, I've done that at parties before in the past. I don't, I, I never wanted to do that for money or anything, but it's right, fun no, at parties. No, yeah. Let's be honest, it's a lot of fun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I, I mean, we, we, joke, we joke around too, I mean. And, yeah, yeah. And, well, we get dinged on that all the time, like some of the other, you know, when we're at like an investigation or something and it's it's like one of the ghost walks or or, or it's not a serious investigation, you know, it's just kind of like a, a fun night out sort of thing. We'll goof off, we'll joke around, we'll we'll break protocol, which is a, a big no-no in like experimentation. 
And I've been called out on that. It's like, well, you guys obviously aren't serious investors. Like, sometimes we're just having fun, not yeah. every. So, yeah, you can't take everything too serious. Come on, no, let have fun. no, no, no. Yeah. You definitely <laughs> can't take us serious at all. So, excuse me, I burped. What else is new? <laughs> uh oh, kind of off track there. Um, that's okay. So okay, so you can't so. People do recall more than one past life, you know, and, and you said, like, the record's, like, six or whatever, which would be really cool. But um, uh, one thing that kind of, one thing I wanted to ask, and it may sound kind of silly, but do, when you're going into these past life regressions, are they always human? Are they sometimes, like, animal? Or sometimes, or is it always from, like, Earth, you know, because we're pretty, yeah. we we would be remiss not to ask if there is any kind of like alien stuff there because we are a paranormal. Group, yeah, so. it's very interesting because, you know, I've dealt with a lot of people who, uh, with alien abduction. And again, uh, as one of the young ladies referred to earlier was that, hey, it's, it's what's their belief. It's what's in their mind and what they think happened to them. I don't judge people. I never, ever, ever judge anyone. But you, you can go from lifetime to lifetime. You can have totally different events happen to you. You can experience things, and again, a good hypnotist, you get the bad ones that don't understand how to set a person up, because when you when you ask someone to see something that happened in their lifetime, they could be killed in a battle, and if you don't set them up for success, which is you will not feel, if you don't say those words, they will feel. Right. It's, and it's one of those things where it's a dangerous thing in the hands of somebody who doesn't know what they're doing. Right, you're, you're going to cause them a second lifetime of PTSD doing yep. that. Yeah. And I'm telling you, it's the things you learn about someone when you go through significant things and points in history and what happened to them, what they felt, what they were experiencing, and more importantly, how they died. People don't understand how they died in that lifetime. And when you take someone from the moment of their death through the transition period, which you can call it heaven, you can call it whatever you want, the transition period, the time before they are reincarnated back into human form, it is amazing what they say, what they say they see, feel, experience, and what they get out of that when you bring that back into their normal everyday life. So is it traumatic for the person to relive their death? No, it isn't. If you're inexperienced, if you're not taught properly to make someone talk to you in the form that you and you have to, again, you're you're planting the suggestion. You will not feel any pain whatsoever. It will be like you are watching it as a movie yourself. And you are simply telling me what is happening in the movie. You will feel nothing. You will feel nothing but peace and calm. You will just simply tell to me what is ex happening in that experience. You can tell me you, what you were feeling, but you will have no feelings whatsoever. Hell, and then you I, get I'd, that. I'd still even be worried about it though, because there, there's movies I watch. You know, they, they make me cry. They make me feel the emotion of the movie mm -hmm. or what you know. Yeah, but if he tells he you cry. not to, he's... he just said cry. Yeah, that, that's what he's saying. He's like, uh, this 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 next scene's coming up. You know. Just yeah. chill out. Okay. Yep. But I can tell you from experience, it works and it happens, and you get the, you get the information, which is what's critical. So, is there any way for us at home to like past life regress ourselves? <laughs> you know, <laughs> I don't know yeah. how to word that. Not without paying them fifty bucks. <laughs> no, I'm just. <laughs> no. <laughs> That's a good one. Um, I I just wouldn't recommend it because. You know, you have to be able to guide someone through anything can pop up during hypnosis. And that doesn't mean just specifically past life regression. Anything can pop up. Mm -hmm. You want someone that's trained to handle any, and again, experience, nothing replaces experience. But especially, I'll, I'll tell you, one of the questions you ask someone when you're first interviewing them for hypnosis or past life regression is, what is your earliest memory? What age? And again, when... The shocker comes in, and it's usually women, unfortunately. When you ask a woman and she cannot remember anything before age eight, there's a problem there. And that tells me as a hypnotist, there is a blockage there that it's something that, that is not being allowed to get through, and it's probably going to be very, very painful, and i gotta, I got to tread lightly, and i got to be prepared. When, how are, so what age is your earliest memory? Probably about eight, <laughs> round about. 
Um, but we I, all know each other's history, so... Oh, I, no, 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 I, yeah. I, I wouldn't get an air dirty laundry out, but I was just curious, like... Yeah, probably about eight. It's... Um, I, I have I, one memory from when I'm four, but everything else is fuzzy. I don't know. Was, oh, I remember one time, I was maybe three, because it's the first time I ever saw a dude with one leg. <laughs> <laughs> I did that thing. It made an impact. I did that <laughs> I did that Great. thing that children do where they stick an entire limb in a fire ant pile. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my gosh. So, um, we actually like have a few interesting questions that popped up. Um, sure. So, uh, Catherine Heath asks, have you ever had someone come back uh, without past life baggage, like a clean slate, as she called it? You know, a really good trained hypnotist is going to ask you questions. And, for instance, there's something you need to remember. As we said, some of the golden rules. Your mind is a wonderful thing, but it also has a critical factor. Your mind will not let you see something you are not ready. Keywords, you are not ready to handle now. It may be painful. You may cry. You may say that was horrible. It may do a lot of things. But if your mind lets you see it, you are ready to deal with it. As painful as it may be, you're ready to deal with it. Now, that's where a good psychiatrist sometimes comes in handy because I can tell you, okay, now we see what happened. We, we see exactly what really, really happened. Now, what do you do with those feelings? Well, how are you supposed to process that? I'm not qualified to do that, and I want you to refer you to someone who is. That's what a good hypnotist does. Right, and that's good. Um... Yeah, I, I, I like any kind of researcher or, like, you know, I, I kind of shy away from a lot of alternative medicine. Because, I mean, there's a lot of quacks out there. But when they, when they want to work in conjunction with the medical field, or, or like us, you know, we're one of the few paranormal teams that want to work with the scientific mm -hmm. community as opposed to just, oh, this is just a thing that only... And with other mean. paranormal groups. Yeah. Right. Um... I also kind of had a question of my own. Um, so, like, phobias, do you think maybe they would stem from past life? A lot of them do. It's the answer is a lot of them I do. I have some really being, weird phobias. Being <laughs> scared of quicksand is not normal. Oh, my God. Must I, I'm actually, past life. I'm really glad you asked that because he was he was telling me a, a story, which I, he's not going to give out his client info or whatever, but he was kind of telling me something about that yesterday, and I didn't, I didn't think to ask, but the, yeah, Allie has a deathly fear. We all love quicksand. to go of going hiking, and she is terrified of quicksand. <laughs> like to the point where if I push her in mud that's just a little squishy, she screams, which is hysterical, yeah. by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you, guys, seriously though, and this is not uncommon. So whether whether or not you are regressed and find out. So if you came to me and during my my questioning in the beginning to find out about you and. I, I, I've been doing this an awful long time, so I kind of know where things go, but when something comes up and I'll say, do you have any issues with anything other than, you know, and again, asking the right questions. For instance, I was on uh, answering questions for about five hours last week, and I had about 100 people throwing questions at me online, and one gentleman, I felt terrible for him because he can't wear turtlenecks. He kept telling me, I can't wear a turtleneck, Aww. and he, he says, I can't breathe if I have tight clothes on. Oh. And I looked at him and I said, look it, I don't care what your parents told you. That's not normal, my friend. That is something yeah. that happened to you that is traumatic. Now, let's. this is a great subject, and I'm so glad you guys got great questions. You know, things that happen to you, people don't understand when you get regressed. <laughs> Why do you get regressed? Because when you are four years old, something that a four-year-old thinks is not the same thing that you at 30 years old thinks. Right. And you have to understand... Stuff. Every time you, you are under hypnosis, you want to make sure you're with somebody who's trained because they have to teach you how to talk to you at 30 and you at 4 years old. And to make the 30-year-old you talk to the 4-year-old you to understand what happened to you and why you now feel these symptoms. And that you, you not me, you must agree, I understand it now. It was a fear that I had as a child. It shouldn't be with me now. And I agree to let it go. I let it go. That understanding is where the relief comes in when they come out of hypnosis. Most people, 95% of people, 
never experience that trauma ever again, that condition or that phobia. Yeah, that, that, that brings up a good point, good point too, because like um, two, two thoughts I had while you were talking about that is like people that might not be good at talking to children or, or understanding children, like the way they speak and describe things would, would have a hard time understanding information that's relayed from like your younger self or whatever. But the, the other thought I kind of had too is the thing is, is, um, uh, st several studies have showed that the that the way memory works, the way recall in your brain works, is every time you're remembering something, and, and this is why eyewitnesses aren't a hundred percent perfect in, in like crime trials. Every time yeah. you're remembering something, you're remembering the last time your brain recalled that data, not the actual data. So if you're carrying a phobia or something from when you're a kid, it's because you experienced it and and didn't understand it at the at the time, like if it was something innocuous, but it scared you because you're a little kid. And then the next time you think about it, you're not thinking about that actual event. You're thinking about how it made you feel and you're recalling it. And so you're, you're stuck in this repetitive loop throughout your whole life. So when I think about, you know, uh, I, I remember when I was a little kid and I, I was looking for some toys or something under the bed and I had looked under the bed and there was this giant tarantula, like the size of my hand under there. It scared the crap out of me. I mean, luckily I don't have a phobia of spiders, but there's nothing wrong with having a phobia of spiders. But, <laughs> but thinking thinking back on it, like me me as a 36 year old man, I know that tarantula was not this big, and, and I know that. But thinking back on it, like I'm, I still see it through the eyes of a little kid. Like it's huge, you know, and it's still like uh, that. Was, that was like a scary thing, you know, but. It's in, but like if, if you can't logic that away, I could see how people would have like a real problem with it and, and need the assistance of a, a hypnotist or, or whatever to kind of yeah. get, get over. Let me, let me give you right. another really good one that you guys will relate to really easily. Let's say that uh, a mom and dad uh, had a baby and they already had kids. And what happens when mom comes home from the hospital with the baby? The whole family comes over, everyone is holding the baby. So little four-year-old Jimmy sees everybody holding his brand new little baby brother. And he sees the, the baby getting passed around to everybody. So he thinks, I want to hold the baby too. Now he runs to mommy and tries pulling the kids out of her arms. What do mommy and daddy do automatically? No, they yell it and they put their hand out and push you away. Now, that was an innocent thing. But in that child's mind, in that little child, four-year-old child's mind, a little seed is planted, and if he accepts it in his own mind, what's wrong with me? Am I not good enough to hold that baby? What's yeah. wrong with me? Everybody else is. Now, that seed could lay dormant for 20, 30 years. But all of a sudden, he starts having this inferior, inferiority complex. He's not good enough. And how many of us beat ourselves up more than anything else? We are always critical of ourselves. But for him, it's to the extreme and it starts affecting your life, that's where you can really help someone overcome something. Right. It, yeah, like, just a, any, like, a minor, you don't, you don't realize it as an adult trying to come up with logic, but m minor things that you do, you know, it's that butterfly effect to the extreme. There, there can be minor things that happen in your life that can just have these big, overreaching consequences. You know, he was talking about Jeffrey Dahmer earlier, and, and the thing is, is, like, if, he, if him and, uh, so many other like serial you know like crazy people that have done these horrible things you go but you know everybody expects when you go back and you look at what happened when they grew up and things like that you expect that oh they were beaten and it was these really horrible things and it turns out no they all had a lot of them had really good lives they were really intelligent people but they, um, they had this sort a of, lot like, of them did, though. well like, I'm enough of them to make an impact on the data uh, yeah. yeah yeah i'm saying there's enough of them to show that it's there's not a specific formula to create a monster. It can be just a real small thing that's not even bad. Well, you, like, you know, uh, you might have been in a past life a quicksand serial killer, and that's why you're afraid of it now. That's like I tell, like my husband especially is if Caitlin comes to him and wants to play, and he says not now, I'm playing this game. In her head, she's going, oh, the game's more important, and he doesn't see it as that way because he's an adult. And he thinks, well, I wouldn't have thought that as a kid. But a kid can see that as such a big, 
like my dad with the watching TV. Well, not right now. I'm watching TV. Oh, so the TV's more important than me? Oh, yeah. It's the way kids process. Yeah. Things, it, just, it makes it. Oh, yeah. You don't even know. Yeah, I, I was watching an interview with Howard Stern. They, they, they were asking why he got in the radio because uh, when he was a kid, he didn't have a good relationship with his dad, who worked as a, a radio engineer or whatever. Mm -hmm. And in Howard Stern's head, he said, well, you know, I didn't have an interest in radio. I had an interest in my dad. And I figured the only way I would get his attention was to get on the radio because those were the people his dad would always come home and talk about and admired. Mm -hmm. And so it was just, and it was just that the guy, the guy was proud. It was, he was a product of the time in the fifties. Yeah. He, he was just proud of the work he did. And he's like, look at these famous people I'll talk to. But in Howard Stern's head, he was like, oh, if I'm going to be good enough to have a relationship with my dad, it's going to have to be, I'm going to have to get on the radio mm -hmm. sort of thing. And and then he even went as far as to say, and then that happened and I still didn't get along with my dad. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of the picture, right? Um, like, you look at things that happen, guys. We, we are born to try and please our parents. We really do. I mean, you look at the great books that have ever been written. One of the best ones is The Four Agreements, which the first time I read that book, it blew my mind away. And it's a deep book in the beginning, but by the time you get to the end, the part that where you learn about where you form your opinions, where if your father, if you were afraid, if your father was afraid of sharks and swimming in the ocean, chances are his, he talked about it all the time, and his kids didn't swim in the ocean. These are things that we don't realize how much of an impact we have on our own children and others around us. I hate, I hate about. saying this because my mom's actually watching this podcast, but and I said this in the last podcast. One of the reasons I was so um, weird about paranormal things because my mom, my mom was into um, more of the occult side of stuff when I was a real little kid. Like my parents let me watch, and I'm not saying they were bad. That's not what I'm saying. But uh, you know, they let me watch horror movies when when I was little, and my mom talked about thing experiences that she had in her life as a kid like in front of me when I was still very, very impressionable. She, she grew up in a house that was, um, that had paranormal activity and, and had a history of things like that. And then, uh, of course, going further back, her mom and her mom's mom, they, they kind of dabbled more in that kind of witchery, occult side of things. And so like, you know, is a, is an eight year old overhearing conversations about, um, well, you know the difference between a ghost and a demon because demons can actually pick up and manipulate things in the house as opposed to a ghost. They can't actually touch anything. They can just create differences in the environment. As an eight-year-old, you and your parents saying it, you just soak that in and it becomes fact. So, you know, I slept with the light on until mm -hmm. I was about 10 or 11 years old until suddenly, like, one day I was like, well nothing's happened in these 12 years. I, I think I'm good now. And, you know, finally the light went off. But, you know, I still had to leave the closet door open because we left some of my toys in there that I was afraid of sort of thing. Yeah. But, but that impression of that impressionability is there. And it's one of the reasons we don't talk uh, about our findings to our clients in front of their kids. Like, we'll, we'll interview the kids and talk to them and get information from them and stuff. But, but everything that we... We show them about the house, evident, you know, negative or positive findings. Either way, it, it's a it's a confidential conversation, so that the parents can choose to relay the information to the children in an appropriate way. Yeah, and, and that's one of the that's one of the big problems I have with other groups is they'll just blurt stuff out, you know, in front of the kids. It's like, okay, maybe the house isn't haunted, but you know, they knew that the parents were worried enough to call paranormal investigators in, and now they're, now they sleep with the lights on just because of that. Yeah. Now, you know what? I should, it's a good time to bring something up because I think you guys would be interested in this, is that, you know, a really a good experience hypnotist can set you up for whatever you want. So say you just wanted to experience past life regression, but you were, you said verbally, hey, you know what? I don't want to, I don't want to relive any deaths. I don't want to do anything like that. It's just like a little computer program. You can say, we're only going to go back to good uh, lifetimes, good memories, positive things. And another thing that, that I learned early on, because I heard a, a few hypnotists on the West Coast were trying this, I would go through lifetimes with people, and at the end, when I'm getting the, doing the wrap-up, I would tell them, if you have any positive memories, qualities, or uh, things that you want to bring back with you now into this current lifetime, 
feel free to let yourself do that. And you would be amazed at some of the things that happen. I had a person who was, during the Roaring Twenties, uh, saw themselves playing a piano. They were very good at the piano at a very young age and would play for their entire family. And when I made that suggestion in the end, bring, that, bring any qualities back. This person could sit down at a piano and play piano and they've never had a lesson in this current lifetime ever. Oh, that is so awesome. And it, it was amazing. Time, so. and, and what's really cool is it didn't last, though. That's the part that I could never figure out. About two weeks later, they were all amazed, everything, but then never again. They just it came and it went. It it's boggles the mind. Hmm. So what was the most uh, what was the most interesting thing you've come across like in past life regression? What was the most interesting past life, in your opinion? I think... I think the, the, the one thing is when people have the preconceived notion because, you know, we all have these, you know, <laughs> I had this guy when I was living in Orlando and there's a, a guy who got me a lot of clients and he was very animated and, and a funny guy and he had a thing for the Vikings and, you know, I was a Viking and I, I could just feel it in my bones and that's why I want to do it. I was a Viking. I know I was a strong, fur-wearing <laughs> you know, sword waving guy and he was just so animated and I'd look at him and tell him the same thing I told everybody. Look at it. it you could be another gender. You could be in this lifetime your your wife could be your daughter in an earlier lifetime. You could be the son in another lifetime. There's so many variations. It's never the, what you expect. Just be open minded and ready for something like that. No, I was a Viking. I love this stuff. You know? <laughs> so I'll give you the short story. Hypnotize the guy, I take him back he, I, he goes where I want him to go. He's at a scene, and I say, hey, open your eyes and describe the scene. Mm -hmm. He opens his eyes, he, and you, his body language, again, his eyes are closed, but his body language just comes out, and he's, his eyes, his REM is going. He's like, I'm standing on the edge of a cliff. I'm overlooking the ocean. Look down there, he says, Viking ships. He's getting all excited. Viking ships, look at them. He goes, Vikings. He goes, I go, well, look down, describe yourself. And he looks down. And he's like, I'm wearing furs. He's getting more excited. He goes, I got fur all over me. I got fur shoes. He goes, oh, my gosh, my hair is long. The wind is blowing in my hair. This is amazing. So I, I wait, and I said, okay, tell me what you do for a living. What do you do? And he sits there. He goes, I'm a sheep herder. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, oh, honey, I la I really seriously almost wet my pants laughing. <laughs> that was great. is excellent. So, um, you said something that kind of caught my attention. I really want to ask. So, you said like something about like, you know, your wife could be your sister in a past life. Do you think people from past lives find each other again, like in other lives? And Do you such a great that? such a great question. I can only tell you the pattern and 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 all that I've ever done, if I ask you, uh, where is Ashton in this lifetime, you will tell me where he is. You may say something like, I go to this certain bar every Tuesday night, Ashton's there, he's a bartender. I don't know him, I, we never talk, but he's there. Everyone around you in this present lifetime and those that you love, they're with you anytime I ask in any other lifetime. You know exactly who they are, what they do, and you can explain to me your association in that lifetime. But it may have been your sister today, may have been your mother in another lifetime. You may be your father's uh, uh, parent in another lifetime. It, it always changes. But it's they're, you're always connected to those you love. So that's comforting to people, especially people who have lost people and they're trying to connect. It's, it's funny you bring that up, too, because, you know, I, I've talked to Rose a lot uh, uh, in between investigations and stuff like that because she, she helps the clients and we, we kind of mutually send people back and forth. But we're pretty good friends and she she was telling me one night that um, she kind of does, she doesn't do hypnosis. She's a, a, a witch. She practices voodoo, uh, old world voodoo, but um, she's she's also a, a sensitive psychic or according to her or whatever, you know, I argue with her about it all the time because I'm an ass. But she was telling, she's like, yeah, in a pat, uh, I found out I was a witch, or I learned to be a witch by going into my past life where I was a witch, and then I just knew all this stuff. Again, I'm like, oh, that's interesting. We got into the conversation. She's like, it's really funny that we're talking about this. This was a lot, this was when we went to Denton. She goes, well, I actually knew you in a past life, too. 
And I'm like, oh, where is this going? <laughs> and, and, and she was, um, basically what she told me, she's like, yeah, when I met you guys at Tyler and started talking to y'all, I instantly had a connection like with you three, I felt like I, I knew y'all and I knew, and you know, it, it was a couple of months before we talked to her again, when mm -hmm. we got that other client we referred and she said, and I was like, Oh, is it weird that we're talking again? Like, did you think you'd see us again? And she's like, yeah, because I actually, you were in like a past life and apparently I was, um, British and like to wear a bowler hat. And, sounds like you. Yeah, um, that sounds a lot which like really, you. It was so funny, but she like brought up all these like really weird details, and I'm like, man, that, that really does actually kind of sound like me. But she said that um, um, I was burned by a mob that she had pissed off or something, and it, it, was, it was just crazy. But I would love for the two of you guys, I would love to be able to come out there and have you do a past life regression on me. And then compare what I tell you through your method. I get dibs to... on the past life regression. I'm calling dibs if we come out there. Well, we could, we could, we could <laughs> maybe plan a trip to Florida. It's, it's, it's come on. It's a, it's a long drive, but we love road trips. Yeah, I'll tell you, I'll tell you I would definitely one. come out there to do it. I would love to have you guys. And I'll tell you another one that that really. Have you ever had a relative where you you or, or someone close to you that, especially a relative that you just. Do not get along with them. Yes, There's yes. something about them. <laughs> All it, of but them. But it's unregistered. You just, something about them rubs you the wrong way, and it bothers you to the extreme where you don't really, and you can't explain it. That's very interesting when you go into a past life regression because usually, and I hate to say this, but usually that person did something really awful to you, including rape or murder, but it's, it, it ends up, for me, the detective, I always want to find out what that is. And it's very interesting stuff. <sighs> Five bucks says my sister murdered me. <laughs> Twenty bucks says your sister murdered somebody, definitely, and they're buried in the backyard. To out oh my gosh, murdered. that's great. Uh, Kat, uh, Catherine uh, on the feed again. She asked, um, and and she's a uh, I know her personally too. She she's a she's a really good uh, uh, listener of ours that I talk to a lot. Um, she said she's a uh, she's a nurse and she actually works. Uh, in the physical therapy field, so I, I know why she's interested. She says, uh, "How do you recommend getting into healing with hypnotism?" So, so you I, know, guess, I guess she kind of has an interest into getting into doing what you're doing as part of yeah. what she already does. Yeah. Well, you know what? It's I, I was fortunate because when I went to college, I was I love psychology. I mean, you guys, everyone fascinates me. I love to know why you are the way you are, what makes you tick, and again, what. Again, I try and say, how can I help anybody, no matter whoever I meet? So at a very young age, I really wanted to study psychology. But if I was in the medical field today and I wanted to make my job easier, I would definitely learn this because, you know, especially nurses, they're the ones that deal mostly with people when they're upset. And if your words, simply enough, if your words can calm someone down, and it makes your job a lot easier and it makes their experience a lot better. So why wouldn't you want to learn things? And again, words are very important and very powerful. And again, you learn body language, you learn how, when to approach people, when to lay your hands on people, how to calm them down. That's a lot to do with it. It is a lot to do with it. If you can get their attention and you can say the right things that are going to calm them down, everybody wins. Is there somebody, is there a place you would recommend her to go to look up information on finding somebody to teach her that sort of thing and, and to be able to like filter out like, how would she filter out who's basically a con artist just trying to make some money off of her as opposed yeah. to somebody that's actually going to teach her? Like, yeah. uh, what, what should she look for? What should she look for? Where should she go? To, to well, you go, it? there's uh, uh, the National uh, Guild of Hypnotists. You can look it up on the <laughs> Internet. It's na the national organization, and you can find out who's locally for you. And you could also look up through the Internet your schools. But, again, nothing precludes you doing your homework and saying to them right up front, I would like a list of references. I want to talk to people. And again, if you talk to people that have been through schools who aren't doing it, why aren't they doing it? Everybody has reasons why they either stay in the field or leave a field. Understood. But you want people that are very successful and have been doing this for a while for, for the right kind of reasons. So don't be afraid to check references on schools or hypnotists at all times. Well, Anybody who's been in the field should be very compliant and very willing to hand you a list of references. 
Right. I, I mean, it's like what we talked about yesterday with my parapsychology degree. Um, you know, I only paid forty five dollars for that online from yeah. a place that's supposedly like one of the most. We all have parapsychology degrees. <laughs> they, they sent them in bulk through snail yeah. mail, and I made yeah. copies and put everybody's name on it. And so there's definitely yeah. places out there. Well, that's why I think like I told you I was I was uh, having a, a discussion with somebody on social media once, and she was telling everyone how she was a hypnotherapist and all this stuff and uh, licensed this and that. She was throwing out more titles than I could believe. Well, I looked up her page. She hadn't even finished uh, high school. Right. Now, when you're talking about, you're saying that you do something that requires a medical degree, and then you, I don't, you know, see, that's the kind of stuff you have to be careful for. Yeah, and, and, I, and, and that's, one of, that's one of the things that we get challenged on a lot, but we, we're very, very careful about what we claim to be. Um, we've all gone to school for different things, but with our day job, well, yours kind of, your day job kind of goes with what, you went to school for, but you know our our day jobs pretty much have nothing to do with what we went to school for, and you know we don't have like PhDs and masters, but we are knowledgeable. We claim to be knowledgeable and studied, and, and we back that up with our experience. But but we never walk into a room and you know I I don't tell people like oh I have a masters in. Uh, mechanical engineering because I don't I am educated in it and you know I know what I'm talking about yeah. but but I I typically refer to my experience not a piece of paper Allie she she went to school for um, criminal justice forensics which involves yeah. like a, a little bit of psychology and stuff like that but she yeah. she's not a paid forensicist she she uses her forensic knowledge for our I repo cars. Yeah, she. There you go. There you go. That, that's Good why I say you. it's loosely related because she's a narc. But, that's great. And, and, then, you know, and Sarah was an EMT for a long time, so yeah, she's not a doctor, but she is. You know, she is an expert about medical things. I can put band aids on people and take your blood pressure. There you go. Hey, let me tell you a good one. Let me tell you a good one. Uh, one of my second schools, I think, that I ever went to, I'm sitting in this class, and again, you know, some of these are, 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 it can be as few as eight people, some of them can be 30 people big, and I was sitting next to this guy who was about 45, maybe 50 at the time, and every time the instructor brought up of, when this happens, you look for this, and then you do this, this guy would constantly be saying, oh, that's why, oh, oh, that's why, oh, oh, that's why, and it drove me insane. So during one of the afternoon breaks, I walk up to him and I said, hey, can I just ask you a question? Every time he's bringing up a point, you're saying, oh, that's why. What, what's going on? Because you're driving me nuts. <laughs> he goes, well, he, and I ask him, he'd been practicing hypnosis and charging people for 10 years. Oh, my God. Never took a class, learned it out of a book, and finally decided to get a class. And now he's understanding all the things he was doing wrong and should have been doing. Oh, my gosh. And I look at him and I said, it's you. It's people like you that give this profession a bad name. And that's what I'm talking about. Oh, my yeah. God. That's what I say to all the other <laughs> paranormal <laughs> investigators. You're, you're, you're the reason no one takes us seriously, asshole. Yeah. Get off TV. It's crazy. It can, it can be really crazy. Uh, uh, a couple more follow-ups. Um... So, but, so, like, okay, so, like, that guy you're talking about, you know, um, basically just doing a bad job and ruining it for everybody else. And then there, there's people that are frauds out there or whatever. Um, it's, it doesn't seem like it's a super regulated field. So if, say, say I went into a hypnotist and uh, it did nothing for me, I felt like the person did a bad job or, or even worse, I actually felt like they were a complete fraud. Who would I report that to? I mean, other than just giving them a bad Yelp review, because everybody's got a bad, we have a bad Yelp review. Um, is there anybody to report that sort of abuse to, considering you're not really, like, regulated? But, well, I, get, I guess you are. You have a doctor that signs off on your thing. But, well, yeah, I mean, you should, you should be dealing with somebody who's a professional who has a business license. And number right. one, if they don't have a business license, I don't think I'm going there. Number two, if they if they have a business license and you have something bad, you can report them to that entity, whether it be a county, it's usually a county place to have like, get your business license. But that's where you would complain, yeah, and the Better Business Bureau. Okay, uh, and, and I and I'm a little late on this, but I kind I kind of thought of it as we were talking about it. But you know, you, we were talking about 
um, preparing people for certain things in their past life to, to put them more at ease with things that might happen or whatever. Um, what to kind of anybody that's interested in like maybe talking to you or talking to uh, another hypnotist or something like that. What are some of the things that they could expect up front, like talking to, like, because you, you go through a, you said you're like us, you go through a pretty lengthy interview process ahead of time. What uh, what are, like, some of the questions you might ask? Like, what kind of setting would that, you know, just like anybody that is interested in doing it, but is kind of anxious, of, you know, some of us have social yeah. anxiety, yeah. Um, and it helps to talk about it beforehand. Could you, like, walk us through a little bit of what that process might be like if I just called you up and said, yeah, I'm really yeah. interested in some hypnotism. Well, again, you want to know what their expectation is. I, w I want to know what you want to get out of this, first and foremost, because I, I need to be able to do that. I need to be able to do that. And in order to find out some things where someone may just say, I can't remember anything before eight years old. Is that good or bad? And I'll say, well, it's, that's not typical. It's just not typical, and there might be something there. It might be something good. It might be something bad. You should explore that. Now, again, I'm trying to find things out about you, which are very important, your religion, how you were brought up, you know, brothers and sisters, uh, past uh, abuse, physical abuse, drugs, very important, self-esteem. I'm trying to determine self-esteem. There's so many things that you want to find out about it. But again, it usually starts with what do you want, what is your expectation, what do you think hypnosis is, and you're educating, educating, educating to try and set them up for success. You always want to set yourself up for success. Now, you know, it's just like I want to go back for a second if I could to the medical thing because, you know, when you talk about how you can use this to better things in, in, uh, in the medical field, uh, there's called uh, surgical hypnosis, which is if someone's going to have a surgery, one of the most beneficial things in the world is to explain to someone who's going to have surgery that surgery is an invasive procedure. Someone sticking metal into your skin and cutting is not a good thing. And even on a subconscious level, your body knows this. So when you set someone up for success and you know they're going to have surgery, you work with them to teach them to relax in the hypnosis and understand that when they <laughs> accept the anesthesia and the first incision that's made with a scalpel, you work on blood flow to that area. You decrease the blood flow to that area. Allowing, again, the body, the mind controls the body. You're allowing the procedure to happen. You're accepting it. You're decreasing the blood flow to that area, and then you program them that the second the final stitch is made, you then focus on that area and increase blood flow back to that area for quicker healing purposes. And you would be amazed at A, because they're totally relaxed during the surgery, B, they've allowed it to happen, and C, increased blood flow to that area, the healing time is incredibly increased. I've had people, uh, my mother was one of the first people I did. The doctor guaranteed me when she had gallbladder surgery, she would be in the hospital for at least seven days. I had her up and out of there in two days. And the doctor came into the thing and said, what did you do to her? Yeah, and that whole just, mind over matter thing, I, that yeah, happened when I... amazing. They did yeah. pregnancy hypnosis for childbirth too. I know they do that. Well, when I, yeah. like, when I, exactly. I didn't undergo hypnosis, but when I got my foot crushed a long time ago and I had all the pins in it and, and I would, and I was going to physical therapy, they said, there's no way you're going to be on your foot again in less than a month and you're never going to be able to walk right again. But I knew that if I didn't, I might not have a job at the end of that month. And so, you know, mentally, I, it, and you could argue that it was, you know, self hypnosis, but I was like, ah, this is going to happen either way and I and I forced myself up in two weeks and I, I was back to work in two weeks with a crush but now not 100 percent but yeah. w but way sooner than what they said my body could physically heal uh, so yeah, yeah I, I, I totally get that um, cool. the the other thing I wanted to do and we haven't we've mostly been focusing on the hypnotism aspect of everything but you also do um, spirit work in uh, and, and I want to touch on that before, you know, we end up getting to a point where we really have to wrap up or anything. Um, but, but what what kind of spirit work do you do? Well, I, you know, it started out when I went to my uh, first school. And, again, I, I was learning about what different courses were available. And, again, people specialize. Some people just want to do regular hypnosis. Some want to do 
past life regression. And, you know, one of the things on there, on the form I was looking at was spirit release. And I asked the instructor privately, I go, what's spirit release? I go, I've never heard of it. And he says, well, you know, you could call it exorcism and you'd understand it in your own mind quickly. He said, but, you know, the term that you want to use is spirit release. He goes, because, again, people have different beliefs. And I look at him, and again, I said, well, I want to sign up for that. I did. I was curious and, and, and everything. And he just warned me against it, which was going to guarantee that I did it, but he warned me against it. <laughs> You're like, said, Sarah. <laughs> and he said, it. as I did learn, it's not for everybody. Right. And you really have to understand what you're doing. It is not for everybody. So I signed up naturally, and I, I remember coming uh, for that that class, and it was to me it was the most fascinating thing. I mean, I'm, I was born Catholic. Uh, I grew up, and and like everybody else, I mean, the first time I watched the movie The Exorcist, I mean, I was scared to death. I was sitting in a dark theater <laughs> with no one around me. I was scared to death. And as a Catholic, I was like, oh my gosh, this stuff is is crazy. But you know, when I actually saw a real exorcism, a real spirit release happening in front of me. What was really interesting was when when he started, he did a remote spirit release on a woman whose son had real sudden addictions and was really almost killing himself. It was, it was really a sad, sad thing. But when I started out, I was about three to four feet sitting away from her. About 45 minutes later, all of a sudden I looked down and I noticed that I had scooted my chair backwards. I was at the wall because of what was happening in that room. And I was like, oh my, it was like, again, to me, the most interesting movie I'd ever been in in my life. And I kept saying, what's going to happen next? What's going to happen next? But, you know, I was the type of person, you know, just like you are, Ash, and I was a serious skeptic. And I said to myself, when, when it was over, I got that woman's total information. And I wanted to hear from her a week later. And I wanted to hear from her son. What had happened to her son? What had he felt at that exact moment? What had he experienced? Had his life changed? And it was amazing. It was life-changing what happened to that guy. He totally went off drugs after that experience. Totally. Cold turkey, done. No side effects, nothing. It was amazing to me. And I was hooked. I was just hooked right from there. Yeah, most of the, the like, um, you call them spirit releases or exorcism or whatever, most of the ones I've been to, and we kind of talked about it a little bit yesterday, is, you know, most people go in with, like, the sage and, and all that stuff, and it's it's this big production. Um, and But there's there's not, it's it's not really what, and I think movies ruin so much of it, too, because, you know, there's, there's no, like, levitations and things flying off the wall. Um, Allie and Sarah... Um, it's it's actually in our, it's one of the chapters in the book where, where they kind of cross over like when they first started kind of um, getting a, li a little bit more serious about things. But you guys actually witnessed uh, we witnessed something. I don't know, I don't know what, what it was. was. <laughs> I mean, I, I mean, it. as an outsider, you know, I I, can, I read like when I when I reread that chapter that we wrote those two chapters we wrote about that. I, I read it from one point of view. It's like, oh, this lady was obviously having a psychological breakdown. Yeah. But but I've heard from a lot of people that have read the book. They read that and they're like, that um because it's not like overproduced like a movie. They're like, oh, she legitimately had uh, a, a few the, a few of the people that have talked about that chapter. They're like, no, that's the that's the first time I've ever seen a like an exorcism or a demonic possession written about in like a truthful way, and I'm like, that's funny because when we wrote that, that's not what we were writing, um, and, and sometimes I, I forget like how objective we are about things because we just present what happened, and it's funny to see people uh, read that chapter and get two completely different, different yeah, stories out of it. And, and I and I haven't talked to a whole lot of people that don't have an opinion one way or the other. They're either, oh, she she had psychological problems, you know, that that were being exacerbated by everybody being in that situation, and then other people are like, well, she got better because everybody was there, and and then the prayer circle thing happened and all that. And I'm like, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. That was a that was one of those nights that you could feel in your bones. And yeah, that's the thing that you can't describe to people is the way it felt. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I've sat in rooms where, and I, again, I've been doing this for 23 years. I've seen some things that just absolutely boggled your mind. I mean, you get to the point now, I mean, 23 years later, nothing 
nothing surprises me anymore. But you know, still you get that feeling and you feel it. And again, it makes you sit up and notice. And and again, you this is something that you don't want to play with. You don't want to. Uh, people don't realize how fragile you know the human mind is. And again, it's not. I do not judge anyone. It's like, what are you experiencing? What do you think it is? What were you brought up? What, you know, you really have to understand everything from that person's point of view. You really have to. And, you know, parents the same way. I have parents, believe it or not, who tell me my child is seeing a dark figure in their room. My child is afraid to sleep in their room. And I ask them, what do you do? I tell them to go to bed. <laughs> That's not what Sarah did at all. It's, it's, you have to understand, again, kids, kids are very, very sensitive, and they have this blank page, and you have to take it very seriously when they have these things, and people do things that absolutely boggle my mind, and again, you don't want to, for instance, like we talked about, if a, if a, if a female cannot remember their early childhood, something traumatic may have happened. You've got to remember, when you're talking about attachment, Things happen, you again have these filters and your, your, your mind is, and your body is a, a protection device. But when you have traumatic things happen in your life, your self-esteem is lowered. You're, it's easy to say, but your shields are down. You become susceptible to attachment. You know, when people are addicts, when people are, are at their lowest points, they become very easily attached. It's just the way it is. And you say to yourself, you know, women who have been abused, women who have been sexually abused, they internalize and they beat themselves up tremendously and they open themselves up for things. And again, it's not for me to say. I go in somewhere and what I get upset about is when people say, well, I'm going to do this, this, or this, or they recommend to someone, just do this. or And you say to yourself, that's not getting rid of anything. And, and I always said to myself, I'm not going to do something unless it works. Never had someone call me back and go a year later, hey, it's back or something's wrong. I, I don't have that kind of thing. I wanted to find out what worked. And some very intelligent men about 10 years ago went and studied psychiatrists that believe in hypnosis, famous hypnotists, famous doctors went in and they studied the most accepted form, which is the Catholic Church's right of exorcism. And you know what they found out? It's flawed. The, the whole thing itself the wording is flawed. Mm -hmm. And to me, it was fascinating when I started reading about this and learning about this and going to school. It's fascinating. So they sat down and they go, what's going to work? And they came up with what's presently taught today, which is spirit release. And to me, that's fascinating. But again, <clears throat> that's why my heart goes out to people who says, I called, they said, when this person went out and did this or did that, well, yeah, it lasted a month and everything. Now, I got the same problem. And again, as you and I talked about, Ashton, my heart goes out to people when they have kids involved in a house. That's when I do a lot of pro bono work here locally because my heart goes out to them. And trust me, when you're sitting in these classes and you find out during the breaks where people come from, when you got priests sitting around you and you say to a priest privately, tell me your name, where you're at, and they beg you, don't tell anybody what I'm doing here. Mm -hmm. I need to find answers for people who are looking to me for help. Right. Yeah, you know, they're, just, they're just looking for that extra that tool that might actually uh, make it to where they can actually help somebody because they're more yeah. interested in helping than fitting in with like their own dogma or something like that. Yeah. And, and uh, I mean, one of the one of the main things that we do more than just our paranormal research stuff and doing podcasts and all that is I I'd say the biggest part of our job is actually being peer counselors because. The main thing is, is especially our residential investigate. I mean, it's different when we go to like the the popular locations to make a video, but our residential investigations, you know, we don't do spirit removals or, or anything like that. We we just go to these places, and ninety percent of the time, we don't actually find anything paranormal there. But we don't spend any less time there. We sit the the very last residential we did, we just sat around the dining room table talking about all the things that happened all the things that were going on in this person's life. It, it turned out she had just gone through a really nasty divorce. Um, there were there were other things going on. And it, it really seemed like the, there was another layer to it. We're not saying she, there wasn't, her, she wasn't having experiences there. there. There were things that were happening she was probably not understanding, but it was causing her to, like, reach out. She, she really just wanted 
it's really weird because her boyfriend or, or whatever was the one that called us out, but she just wanted somebody. We got invited. She's like, please come back. Come talk to us because we were just there kind of talking to her as a peer about these different things going on and, and making them feel better. And I have a lady that, that calls our number all the time. And I'm, I mean, it's kind of hard to talk to her because she is kind of kooky. She, she swears she's been abducted by aliens and the government's put a chip in her brain and stuff like that. But I'll just sit on the phone with her for a couple of hours, letting her just kind of talk and, and talking her through the logic and, you know, trying to encourage her to, to talk to other people and kind of like reintegrate and things like that. But yeah, I'd say that's a bigger part of our job than actually <clears throat> going in and proving there is paranormal activity. Yeah. Uh, um, Cause I'm just as happy finding that there is no paranormal activity, but there's some kind of underlying thing going on as I am when we go in and find physical evidence to, to back up what these people have been experiencing. And that's just kind of where I come from on it is I, I don't care if it's paranormal or not one way or the other. I just want to go have that experience and, and talk to people. Yeah. I think I took a long time ago when I started, I, I did a ghost hunt and I took a, a, a gentleman with me who was very, very psychic and tried to, to incorporate ghost hunting with psychic abilities and with what I knew as, as, as a hypnotist. And to me, it was interesting because the girl who was the leader of the uh, paranormal research group, and she had the guy who had all the equipment, which um, the amount of money that guy spent on equipment was amazing. <laughs> and the people and the, the hours that they spent setting up and getting ready was amazing. But you go into this house, and, you know, they're looking for things like you guys do with, you know, recorders and, and cameras and all stuff and everything. It's so great. And I'm trying to just sit, stand there and, and incorporate all this with, hey, what am I feeling at this moment? What am I sensing as I walk through this house? When I close my, can I relate to anything in the air that may relate to the history of this place? And it, to me, that stuff is fascinating. I love it. Yeah, I love the history of it probably more than the science of it, but, you know just as far as it relates to our study, we have to cover our basis. Um, so you guys got any, we need to kind of wrap up because um, we actually got other stuff to do tonight. But uh, <laughs> you guys got uh, any other? Aside from playing a trip to Florida to see if I would pass. Yeah. Out, we're good. Yeah. Well, okay. So um, we, <laughs> we might be planning a trip to Florida to come hang out. You got any, if we're if we come out there, you've got to show us some haunted locations, though. That's the deal. But you know what? Southwest Florida is really kind of boring in that aspect. <laughs> I, I, I miss up north because everything up north is haunted. It's so great. Well, maybe but you should come to beach. Texas because you said there's not a lot that surprises you, but I'm pretty sure there's a couple of places where we could probably psychologically damage I'm you. I'm not going to take him to the one that would psychologically damage him. <laughs> I don't want to do that to you. I'm pretty sure their beaches are haunted. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm not taking anyone who's sensitive at all out to the one place. I, you know, oh, oh, we re we really need to take Rose out there because she's just asking for it. You know? Yeah, yeah. She she hey, looks still grave dirt from there. Hey, look at really. I just want to take a moment and just really thank you guys. I think what you're doing is very important. Oh, I really you. think these podcasts are absolutely wonderful. You ladies had the greatest questions, and I really admire what you guys do for a living and how you're you're helping. You're just helping, and I think that. We should really encourage more of this, and I hope you do more in the future. There's a lot more subjects we could talk about, and I just want to thank you. You guys are doing awesome, awesome work. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Any any opportunity to talk to other people in the field that you know we look at on an equal basis that aren't just ripping people off is always great. So yeah. And anytime you wanna, anytime you wanna just PM me or anybody on Facebook, any of the listeners, just PM me. I get them all the time. And I'll reply when I can, and I love the questions. Okay. How and where can they find you? Um, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah uh, Facebook, yeah. Which, Facebook which? is easy. It's Facebook private messenger. That's, a, that's the easiest way to do it. And I, I really I hang out on the para, uh, Paranormal Hauntings uh, page okay. a lot. All right. Just trying to clear up things for everybody who's got real questions. With, you need with to, uh, you, you should probably also join the uh, NT Paranormal uh, discussion group, too, while you're at it, too. So Excellent. That, that'd be an easy way for people to get a hold of you through us or, or just directly too so i'll shoot you a link to that later cool. uh, on our okay. website and all that and um we'll throw up some links and stuff in the comments for your book and and all your info so people can get a hold of you and if they need help or advice or anything like that because excellent yeah that'd be great and we'd love to have you on again 
Yeah. Oh, anytime, fun. anytime. Well, thank you so much, guys. Have a great day. Right, bye. It was nice bye meeting bye you. Now. See you later. Bye bye. All right. So that was Patrick T. Chrissy, which I said I'll be putting his uh, information up in the comments and the uh, the description uh, a little bit later after this goes into archives. And um, of course, we've got some really good shows uh, planned out in the future. I hope y'all liked this one. I, I, I'm really happy that we all three got together again. It's so much. Yeah. Like I, I know I've been kind of carrying the torch week after just to kind of keep it going, but I am so boring because all I do is I talk <laughs> about this. It's not fun unless you guys are ripping on me. In in like I was trying to explain to him in, in the pre roll yesterday is. You know, I'm like, because uh, he's like, hey, if, if I go on too long, be sure to, you know, let me know. I'm like, that's not going to be the problem. <laughs> I'm like, we have a signal. If, if I'm talking too long, Allie's like poking me in the side because I won't <laughs> shut up. Um, but I'm really glad y'all did the podcast. With yeah, you. I'm glad I like, was um, able to do it. And so um, what's, what's funny is we, we were going to do a double header this week. Sarah was going to do one with me Thursday on Parasomnia. But the funny thing is, is she, she was, was having problems staying awake because <laughs> <laughs> she's she's a little under the weather. So I, if if we can make it work, we're uh, our next episode is going to be about parasomnia, which Sarah is our expert on that. Not because she's a doctor, but because she suffers, suffers from, from like me. five out of the ten parasomnias <laughs> on the list. Um, so we've got that coming up. Uh, I also wanted to talk a little bit about one. And I don't know when this show is going to be because I'm waiting on correspondence, but there was a lot of interest in the Amityville uh, murders and, and the haunting and all that. And and I kind of talked with – did I tell you about that? Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. So I wrote uh, Robert DeFeo uh, a letter in prison that I mailed off. Uh, Brad's going to try to get ago. me into doing a meeting in the prison with him. Um, he's that. actually up for parole next year. Um, he will actually answer letters and things like that. And so I think I had some really good questions for him that I, you know, it, it, the guy was found guilty of murder, but you know, I don't, can my friend Sarah uh, come visit? That's the main question. <laughs> I don't know, but I'm waiting for, uh, I'm waiting for correspondence from, uh, 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 DeFeo Jr. on that who did the original killings that you know and then the Lutz has moved in and then there was the whole haunting thing so I'm waiting on that and then um, Charlene uh, Low Camp uh, she runs the Paranormal Hauntings magazine um, of course they're six hours ahead of us so it's kind of hard to schedule some stuff so that'll definitely be another <coughs> Saturday one but uh, she was going to do an interview with us and then of course uh, another episode we have planned is we're actually going to have Rose Demain here with us with the table set up and she's going to do like readings and do readings for people and answer questions for people online i thought that would be like a really that would be a cool, fun episode a really crazy cool episode because she's she's like us she's a total cut up and I, I don't know how i'm able to remain friends with her considering i don't believe in magic and she's a witch <laughs> um uh, but, i mean she's great though we, we we have mutual respect with her somehow as big of an asshole as I am. Well, so. speak, well, she's not. She's able to tolerate you. I'm not sure how. Yeah, I like know. I don't I, know how y'all tolerate me. She probably likes us better. I I imagine so. So um uh, but I want y'all here for those episodes for sure. And of course um. Well, and my mom just had surgery, so that's going to be up in the air. She had a knee replacement. So right. When I need to go and sit with so, her. So and, next week it might just be. Um, um, yeah. Next week might be an episode of just me and Allie, or just me if Allie's not available. So um, I might put up another poll about what the what the next uh, median topic is because I'm trying not to hit the ones that your inputs would be really good. Like especially with like DeFeo, I know she was she's huge into that, and you know you're into forensics and criminal psychology. So talking about um, like serial killers things. without you two here would probably be a that would be a big no-no. Especially yeah, that I, specific I, one, because I've been obsessed with him since I was little. You all would probably find me in my refrigerator the next day if I tried they to They never run. find you, silly. <laughs> oh, my so God. With me and Allie joining oh. forces. <laughs> uh, the, the only other thing I want to talk about before we go is... Uh, uh, I know we haven't posted up any new uh, episodes of Investigations. 
Um, that's not because we haven't done any. It's because, uh, actually, I, I found a lot more stuff in all that footage. That it's, it's taking longer than normal to make those episodes because we, we actually hit two locations in a row that uh, we kind of found the honeypot out of nowhere. Like, it defies the odds. Um, so the, the old jail museum, that is taking forever to do because um, the second investigation... Like, there's stuff I need to analyze, like, every 10 minutes of footage on every single camera, because a lot of stuff did pop up. And I was really surprised with the uh, Yates Duke cabin footage. Like, remember, during the live, we only found three EVPs. Mm -hmm. So far, I found about 10, just, just going through there. And they're, like, verifiable ones where the camera's on us and nobody's talking. And that first one me and Allie got, that was... Yeah. It, oh, the knock? No, there was the, one that was, like, whispering. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, oh, that's weird. Um, crazily enough, I'm actually finding a lot of that stuff at that location. So we, we may forego doing an episode on that and go back for a second visit while um, they still have access to that building. Because remember, that was up in the air. Yeah, okay. Uh, so we may go back for a second visit before we try to present what we found on it so and if anybody's frustrated that we haven't put any new investigation episodes out it's because we're actually putting together some really good ones uh you know instead of just trying to crush out what we did when we usually don't find anything so uh so hope you all enjoyed the episode i've got uh we now have a post roll bumper that uh it's got some of our uh, affiliates and things like that in there so just kind of Listen for that. It's got some more information on how you can find out more about NT Paranormal and all that good stuff. But we hope you all like the episode. We really liked having you all. Um, it's especially great when you guys tune in live and, and ask questions like you did because that, that gives us more things to talk about. And it, if there's a topic you guys want to hear about, tell us so so that we can cover the things that you want to see. I mean, that's I think that's what makes us better. We um, hear for you. Yeah. So, um, thank you guys for coming in. I hope we, I hope we get back to doing this together more often. Um, so this is our first special of the year for all three of us. And then, and, and ho <laughs> hopefully soon we can get Kristen back in too. Yeah. Um, so. All right. Bye everybody. Thanks everyone for tuning in today. We hope you enjoyed the episode. If you did and you would like to know more about NT Paranormal and our research, please visit us at www.ntparanormal.com or our Facebook page at facebook.com slash ntparanormal. You can also check out our book, After Dark Paranormal Investigations, True Cases of the NT Paranormal Team on amazon.com or find our articles in Paranormal Hauntings Magazine. Before we go, we would also like to thank our supporters at Paranormal Hauntings Magazine, Paranormal Investigations Equipment, PIE, Ghost House Paranormal, the Granbury Paranormal Expo, and the Tyler Paranormal Conference. Until next time, everyone stay safe out there and stay open-minded.